this week when it was revealed that testing kits containing a flu virus which no one born after 1968 is immune to had been sent around to more than 3,700 laboratories in 18 different countries from Brazil to Lebanon out of a lab here in the United States, the College of American Pathologists. And they have been sending this around between October of last year and February. This is either a fantastic oversight or an act of very subtle and carefully considered bioterrorism. We don't know which it is or exactly who's motivated here to do what, but we've got somebody who probably has some pretty darn good guesses with us right now today, Jim Mars, the author of Alien Agenda, Rule by Secrecy, and so many other of the great books that we rely on to keep our noses in front of the truth. Welcome, Jim. Hey, Whitley. Yeah, this is definitely a very strange thing because um, if this was some sort of intentional terrorist attack, it, it was not done very constructively. Uh, even though it was sent out all across the world, it was, after all, sent to testing laboratories, which should have the capability of handling something like this. Uh, it may turn out to be simply a huge bureaucratic uh, mistake. However... It is also being compared to the anthrax attacks that took place immediately following the uh, terrorist attacks of 9-11. And I might point out, as most people probably have failed to really seriously stop and know, is that that anthrax that killed five Americans was weapons-grade military-type anthrax that was only made or found in the United States military. So uh, I think there's some very strange things going on in the health issue of terrorism. And I would also uh, like to point out the and remind everybody of the strange and mysterious series of deaths uh, of microbiologists that have taken place around the world over the past uh, several years. Uh, this is very disquieting because these are the very people who could tell us more about these deadly strains of disease and probably come up with some sort of a vaccine or some sort of a cure or remedy. And furthermore, if you've read my book, Rule by Secrecy, you'll know that there is a movement by the globalist. That's what they call themselves. Some people refer to them as the New World Order. But these are the people within the secret societies who are trying to come up with their own agendas and their own plans for reducing world problems. Uh, General Maxwell Taylor, a insider with the Council on Foreign Relations back in the early 70s, was quoted as saying that, uh, and I think he was reflecting their viewpoint when he said that by the next century, meaning now, they really needed to get rid of about a third of the world's population and that they would do this through limited uh, regional conflicts like the fighting that's now going on in Iraq and in Afghanistan and Colombia and other places. Disease, like the starvation that is continually rampant in Africa, sub-Sahara Africa, and diseases, okay? And, of course, this is why all of a sudden now we're seeing a series of very strange and debilitating diseases uh, like um, various strains of influenza, the Ebola, the hantaviruses, the uh, mad cow, the, you know, you name it. All of these strange diseases are now suddenly popping up and that are certainly affecting, if not debilitating, uh, mankind's natural immunization system. So I think that whether this turns out to be a terrorist attack or whether it turns out to be simply some sort of incredible bureaucratic mistake, I think it should alert all of us that we better be paying more attention and closer scrutiny to uh, these matters because if you don't have your health, you really haven't got anything, do you, Whitley? Well, you really don't, Jim. And what is so disturbing about this is obviously uh, it's being considered very seriously at top levels, but there's been no planning, uh, no forethought at all put into it. 
Uh, you told me before we got on the air what the White House press secretary said about this, which did two things. One, it was a laughably silly statement on the one hand, and on the other hand, it does mean that there's concern. That's true, and of course, that's uh, you know, it's a typical polit- politician's uh, remark to show concern and yet also give evidence that they really don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, what, what did Scott he say? McClellan, oh, yeah. Yeah. Scott McClellan, the White House Secretary, uh, said that they are busy assessing the risk and they don't want to take any chances and that the Centers for Disease Control is working on it and yada yada. And then he ends up by saying, what we're asking is that if anyone sees any suspicious illness, that it be reported immediately. Well, you know, God, what are you talking about well, What, are they, yeah, what is my suspicious neighbor, illness? You know, is coughing? Do I report him? Uh, what? What? Well, now, you know, speaking of suspicious illnesses and the loss of so many scientists who might be quite crucial in all of this in the near future, uh, we have, um, uh, Ann and I have been not living in Texas for quite a while, and we, we may be back there soon, just for a visit anyway. Uh, we no longer, uh, we've, our house, we don't, we had a house in San Antonio, we no longer have any more, but anyway, uh, our doctor immediately upon hearing this said, no, no, you can't go back there. Annie's been in the hospital. She's got to get a booster for pertussis, which is whooping cough, because there is an epidemic of whooping cough in Texas. And I was flabbergasted. Then I found out that my brother's wife, probably my brother, my nephew, his son, had all had the disease recently. And mm. you don't read anything about this in any newspapers, but no, it's there. no. Well, of course, that gets back to my main soapbox, which is uh, there is no real news media in this country any longer. There's only uh, corporate advertising distribution systems uh, that are generally controlled by about three major corporations, and they only and this, take and this things distraction that they want system, to hear. Jim. This thing that distracts us always from what is important, like. Right now, we're finished with Terry Schiavo. Before Terry Schiavo, what was it? Uh, some movie star, probably. Now we're going to go back to Michael Jackson. And uh, what we're never going to do is look down. There's no one going and looking under the under the, uh, under the the rocks. I found out there's in our newsletter this week a fantastic buried story that the Pentagon has lost track of $2.3 trillion. <laughs> and, and that's just typical. I mean, is that incredible? What's the, what's your excuse? Uh, gee, I had it when I came in. Uh, you know, of course, you and I both know, Whitley, that that money is not missing. And it's not, it didn't just disappear. That is what is funding the covert government of the United States, the shadow government, the secret team, as Colonel Prouty called it, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, parallel government that, that David, uh, that Bill Moyers talked about, the the people who are really trying, who have covert agendas, and they are getting the U.S. Ta- taxpayer to fund their efforts at globalization, or to put it more succinctly, world control. Right, and folks, we're going to have to close down here with uh, Jim. We're just talking, just very briefly, we're going to be talking to Stephen Sora in just a moment. And, you know, it'll remind you when we get to Stephen Sora what this country's really all about and what we need to take back, because we've lost it. We lost it, and when President Truman said uh, after his after his uh, term in office, what was, the, asked what was the biggest mistake he made, he said very simply, forming the Central Intelligence Agency. He was absolutely right. When Dwight Eisenhower uh, left office, he warned that the military-industrial complex was a grave danger to the freedom of the United States of America. It has happened, folks. This thing is strangling us. It is taking the life right out of us. It is threatening your children right now. you got to get... we got to get things changed here. We've got to take action on our own behalf. And believe me, nobody in Washington right now, not one single politician from either party is going to be of any help whatsoever. Okay, let's just hope this flu does not get at us and that we are not going to be decimated in some kind of nefarious plot to reduce the Earth's population. Of course, I don't notice any general generals or uh, any of these leaders worrying about them being in the among the victims, Jim. No, of course not. 
Yeah, I'm with you 100%, uh, uh, Whitley. Uh, we've got to start taking charge of our own lives, protect particularly now that we see it comes right down to the uh, medicines we take, to the air that we breathe, the very things that our families, our children, our grandchildren are going to be dependent on simply to live and survive. Thank you very much, Jim Mars. Next up, Stephen Sora and a little bit of real information about what got this beautiful country started. A wintry day offshore in the year 1524. A tiny ship explores along a hostile coast, and they see a tower. They recognize it as a Templar baptistry. The Italian explorer Verrazzano maneuvers his ship closer and closer yet and discovers an incredible secret, the key to a dream, a mythical land of freedom from religious oppression called Arcadia. And he finds all this in what is now Newport, Rhode Island, right here in the USA. Don't miss this enthralling true story. Get Stephen Sora's Lost Colony of the Templars right now from the unknowncountry.com store. Also this week on Mysterious Powers, Ann and Stephen Sora talk about his research into relics, and this is wild, wild stuff. Some of them are real. You are listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online and on the IBC Radio Network. There is a secret history of the colonization of the Americas. From Canada to California, there are secrets that find no place in the history books and many subjects that have been purged from historical discussion in hope that they will be forgotten. So says Stephen Sora in The Lost Colony of the Templars. Get your seatbelts fastened because we're going on a journey into the deep past. We're going all the way back to 3000 B.C. to find out some of those secrets. Welcome to Dreamland, Stephen Sora. Great. Thanks to be it's ha I'm great to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you, Stephen. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's okay. I, uh, I, I'm excited. This is the, this is about the best book about the secret exploration of the Americas that has been written. And I know you were trying for that brass ring because you are very, very involved in the community of, of Templar authors and you want your newest production to be something that will excite the best of them. And as far as Templar readers and scholars are concerned, I don't consider myself a scholar, but I'm a very, very interested party. It certainly has excited me. Verrazzano's secret mission to, to America. Let's, I guess, the best way to start with this is not to start with Verrazzano. I want to go back to the really early stuff. Let's go back to the Orkneys together. Now, we're going to go to the Orkneys north of Scotland, a wild place where Huge eagles fly that have been known to carry off, even in recent times, according to Stephen. Uh, they, it, it, let's put it this way. In the reserve where these eagles still live, they cannot, there are certain eagles, they can't go into their territory except adults in pairs, two by two. They don't even allow teenagers into the territory because these eagles with six foot wingspan will just maybe try to carry someone away. But it wasn't always like that in the north, was it? Now, I think once upon a time the North was much more hospitable than it is now. The climate uh, was warmer, and a lot at the time a lot of these monuments were built in the Orkneys. There existed a very large population of people that were uh, one able to study for the science that was necessary, and two actually take place in take part in building them. Now. There, there are some stunners in the book, and we're going to get to a lot of them in the course of this. But let's first begin with the Orkneys and with the the ruins that have been found there, and exactly what they mean in terms of our very, very ancient knowledge of calendars and so forth. Up, up to recently, most of the dating that has been done has shown things. Uh, in Egypt and in Sumeria to be the oldest and recent dating is setting the clock back as far as monuments that are found on the Atlantic and Orkney seems to be a, a cradle of this science and of this building 
there's uh, a handful of monuments that uh, are able to perform calculations that we've only recognized in uh, the last hundred years and for the most part in the last ten years we're, we're just learning just how much these uh, ancients were able to do. The um, Scarab Bray, the story of um, this place in the Orkneys is truly amazing as we didn't even know it was around until about a hundred years ago when one of the Orkneys fierce storms actually ripped the roof off which the roof was a turf uh, grassy mound that uh, then showed that there was like the city built under there it um, it had things that we didn't know was possible it almost uh, sounds like the Flintstones they had stone doors that were hinged and that were able to be locked they um, had kitchens. They had um, actually sanitary facilities that um, predated what was built in Crete. And uh, most of the rooms were set up as kind of cells with passageways to the other cells. It's um, very likely that the whole place could have served as kind of a university for a pre-Celtic people, a pre-Druidic people that um, were working towards uh, understanding the science. And what was the science they were working toward understanding? Well, part of it was in, in the measurement of um, time and of space, and how they calculated these different things was through monuments that would, one part would exist in one place on a hill, then the next place would exist on another hill, and they would create places where uh, they could calculate the eclipses, uh, the solstices and equal equinoxes, uh, the declination of the moon, which is something that's uh, not really commonly known, and through that they could also measure distances from one place to another. So tell us, goes, tell us, just before we go on, we, we shot past the phrase declination of the moon, and I think you might try explaining that to us just to keep us uh, up, to, up to speed. Well, it's, it's actually not something that's hard to understand. It's more like the sun rises at a different spot on the horizon every day and uh, as we get towards uh, the change of the seasons, the sun may be all the way to the north or all the way to the south the moon does the same type of thing and when it gets to the end they call it the declination a better um, a better description might be a lunar standstill for about three days it appears just to be staying at that same place when the moon rises at night and when it sets in the morning and then it starts going back in the other direction and this um, was used to measure time uh, to create a calendar they uh, used both a solar and lunar calendar and it was a 19 year uh, cycle that uh, would rectify the moon and the sun coming up in the same place. The Greeks would learn about this and name it um, almost 3,000 years after the people on the Orkney Islands had understood it. Now, something that fascinated me in the book is the fact that the Orkney, the activities on the Orkneys were taking place around 3,000 B.C., and lo and behold, the Mayan calendar begins in just about 3000 BC, 3113 BC. Is there any significance there? Was there some kind of incredible discovery taking place in a global, world girdling civilization around that time that we have now entirely lost track of? Uh, I think the answer to that question is yes, because there's several places that right around that 3200 BC, um, the Sumerians uh, were growing as a civilization. Egypt was uniting um, the south and the north in the first dynasty. The uh, the Mayan calendar, I think the date is 3113 B.C. In China, um, a certain dynasty just evolved at, at that point. So it's very possible that actually some cataclysmic event might have happened and uh, and people spread from one area to other areas and and found safety in those areas and that was kind of um, the, the diversion of maybe one group that had such knowledge uh, two separate places where uh, this knowledge then spread this is so fascinating because then uh, the reason we've gone so far back, by the way, to talk about the Templars and the discovery of the Americas in uh, the Middle Ages is it will become clearer soon because it's going to be linked in a very odd way from this material to certain types of octagonal churches and in particular the cathedral at Aachen, which is a 
a real window into a most amazing story. But before we begin to go there, uh, Stephen, we, we must talk about the various visions of Christ that existed, <coughs> excuse me, that existed in the world in the past. The vision of Constantine and the current church fathers being very different. At one point in the book, you say that if we knew the actual life of Christ, we might be quite surprised to find that it was radically different from what we have assumed from the stories that we've learned. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? The uh, We have a very um, watered-down and filtered version of what went on at that time, and Constantine is probably the greatest reason for that. The uh, Jesus Christ may have been part of a tradition of learning that uh, I believe actually spread out of the Orkneys and out of the lands that they called the lands of the Hyperboreans and to the west and to the east. The uh, the Essenes uh, may have been part of that, and Jesus may have been part of a, a very mystical cult that combined um, Eastern religion such as Buddhism with um, Western knowledge such as science and uh, and he was kind of um, the point where all this came together. He was part uh, king in an earthly sense and part um, the priest king, the religious king that uh, led the people. He tells us so many times in the Gospels that there are stories that he's telling that are meant for those who have ears to hear and that's kind of um, a password. There's the rest of us that understand the nice fables and, and we understand nursery rhymes in different cultures, but we don't know how much of a story is behind them. And so Jesus, on one level, preached to those who were the masses and just needed the, the morality tale, and on another level was um, conveying a message that included science and uh, and included the... Um, that these secrets were being passed along through this oral tradition. And perhaps that science is a great science of the relationship between the human spirit and the cosmos. Uh, those who have ears to hear, well, I like to believe that on this radio program and on Mysterious Powers and on this website, we are evolving a new audience. We are evolving an audience who do have ears to hear. So keep your mind open. Uh, there are going to be some things that you're going to hear now uh, that are very real and very extraordinary because Stephen Sora is among those seekers who has really found some gold, some genuine gold, and we're going to delve into that gold. I don't think, Stephen, I'm not sure that even you yourself are totally aware of the implications of what you have found. I know I wasn't until it kind of hit me in a burst after reading the book that, oh, wow, look at this. But anyway, we're going to get into that a little bit more when we come back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland online and on the IBC radio network. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're talking to Stephen Sora, his very important new book, The Lost Colony of the Templars. And he's also on Mysterious Powers this week with Ann Strieber, talking about uh, what's it called uh, Treasures from Heaven, uh, his book about about relics and a lot of insight about the nature and meaning of relics largely hidden now. We don't understand what they actually mean, but it can be recovered. It can all be recovered. Now, before we left the air, I made a big, big promise, and let's try to get to that and try to fulfill that promise, Stephen. And to do that, I want to go now all the way forward from the Orkneys now, in the Orkneys, we understand we have had a round, a circular uh, 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 str ruin found that has a similar, uh, similar significance calendrically to Stonehenge. Is that correct? Yes. And this is 3000 BC. Stonehenge is perhaps 1500 BC, 1500 years later. Now, just as an aside, it, you know, Graham Hancock, in his first book, had the theory that perhaps the Earth itself had changed position at a, some point in the past. Uh, in other words, it's possible that what is now the far north, Hyperborea, 
would have been maybe farther south at a certain point. Uh, and maybe th- this is why, because the thing is, y- y- there's not been nothing, in, in, even as far back as 3000 BC, to suggest that the, that 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 northern Scotland was as, was anything like the hospitable place it must have been to have sustained a substantial population using, after all, uh, uh, methods of agriculture that were not all that advanced, despite the fact that they knew a lot about the calendar. There, we know their agriculture wasn't all that advanced. What do you say to that? Why why were they doing so well there that far that long ago? I I think it's true that there probably was, uh, for whatever um, geological thing happened or whatever catastrophe happened, there was probably a major shift. There are places up there that they say the compass doesn't work, which is interesting, that um, some kind of pole shift occurred that they can't even get a magnetic reading in, in different places. The uh, If you go to the Orkneys, they're just about treeless. The only places that they've been able to grow trees now are on the side of buildings cause, because these buildings shelter the trees from the the winds that come across the Atlantic. Once upon a time, that wasn't so. It was able to support a, a full culture there. And, now, the, and now, a trade existed from one place to another that uh, today has been really reduced to fishing and grazing as, as far as um, a way of making uh a living there. What's so interesting is if the Orkneys had been where they are now, the winds would have been like that in 3000 BC too, because the conditions would have been the same there. It's very strange, really, and it's it's not really the whole thrust of this. And I want to move on now. Uh, uh, I want to move on to a certain god and a group of gods and an idea that goes way, way back into our past. Let's talk a little bit about Og. And, uh, if folks, you laugh at that name, Og, and, and it gives its, uh, itself to the word ugly. Who was Og, and why did he become ugly? Well, Og in Irish mythology is, uh, in one case, the sun god. Uh, they would call him Agma, and uh, he was also the person that brought the letters, which would make him kind of like the Greek Apollo, and it seems like so many important things came out of now, this. Now brought this brought the God. letter brought letters from where and from whom? That he he actually is um, given the credit for bringing the letters to people. So he's the letters of, of like language. A, a Prometheus that brought the fire. Uh, correct. He brought the language to people. Wh- where did he get and the, the letters? ability to uh, make runes and other coded? Um, they call it the alphabet of the trees and things like that. Where did he get the letters? Um, I guess it was just a science that wasn't there before, and so. But when, wasn't the tradition that he got them from the sun? Yes. Yeah. He. Are you there? Yes, kind of like the the Apollo myth. Right, and tell us uh, uh, tell us the Apollo myth. Apollo is uh, also kind of the bringer of all different sciences, and and. Apollo kind of evolved in different places to be more of a base god, like the Greeks had uh, the wolfish Apollo and uh, and all. But Apollo was a sun god. The the name, uh, in a kind of a convoluted way, even went as far as Egypt, where the uh, he was the opener of the ways. He's great. Um, possibly gets the uh, credit for opening the stargate, the thing that connects Earth to to the sun or to the the planets, and and through him he um, he brought all sorts of different knowledge, not uh, knowledge of agriculture and things like that. So not just uh, the knowledge of writing. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Sinclair family in a moment. And but before and about Apollo and about the sun and the sun god and the tradition of the sun. But before I do that, I'm going to just drop in a little piece of personal information. Uh, I was in the Gurji Foundation for many years in New York, and I was I knew Lord John Pentland. The name Pentland, I'm sure, will resonate in Stephen's mind. Uh, uh, Lord Pentland was uh, was of course a uh, was a uh, the Sinclairs were among his ancestors. And uh, I knew also Madame Jean de Saltzman, who was the white Russian head of the Gurji Foundation in those days. Uh, and Madame de Saltzman once said to me a most extraordinary thing. She said, the great secret and the thing that you must understand in 
being awake, truly awake, you must know the intelligence of the sun. And I want to ask you if that resonates in your mind, perhaps with a very secret, hidden, ancient tradition that has to do with the relationship between the sun and something about the evolution of the human mind that we maybe don't understand, but it is expressed in the myth of Apollo. It does, um, in the way that the sun is the bringer of all life, and so Apollo then is kind of uh, the son of this sun god, is uh, the bringer of knowledge on earth, the knowledge to humans to get them above um, the station before they had the civilization. Now, we go back to the myth of Apollo, and of, uh, uh, or, excuse me, to the sun, and to solar temples, and to a certain shape of temple. Uh, could you describe this particular shape that figures so importantly in the book? Uh, the best description is an octagon in a circle, and the octagon symbolizes the number eight, which is uh, infinity, eternity. It's um, kind of how they build a baptismal font in churches today. It was something that um, the Templars, when they went to Jerusalem, brought back and, and started building. They called them octagonal chapels or, or round chapels, and, but basically they were the same thing in that way. What's really interesting is uh, we talk about different uh, the sun gods and other gods. In uh, the Phoenicians, or the Syro Phoenicians, had a god called Hadad, and he was basically seen as a weather god, but um, this again it relates to like the sun god. He had the power to fertilize the earth, to warm the earth, and so he was necessary for that type of fertility. Hadad's um, temple was built in the city of Damascus, and uh, so once upon a time the um, that was the the center of religion there in Damascus. Then there was Saint John the Baptist when he was beheaded. His head was buried in the same temple in Damascus. They they didn't really see much of a difference between Hadad and St. John, which is really interesting because the feasts of St. John are June 24th, and and the summer and winter solstice feature in this myth. Yes, the, and of um, course the summer solstice is what, June the 21st, I believe. Or June the right, 20th. and those, so right, those three right days are very important. It, the, the last day um, called Midsummer's Eve right. in like in Celtic lands. Uh, now, June John 24th, the Baptist is very important to understanding this because John the Baptist represents the old God, the God who in one of the Gospels, I believe, says, John the Baptist says, I must dim for Christ to become bright. I believe he says something like that. Right, and, and, and like the tale in, in Celtic lands and probably um, other places was that the old son would die to allow the new son to come in. And in some cases, I think it was Fraser that wrote about how um, in some places the king actually ruled uh, for a year or for nine years, depending on where it was. And often he was killed then. And uh, at some point we started to substitute. The king wasn't actually killed anymore, um, but a human might be sacrificed on that day. Or um, later a goat, as in scapegoat, might be sacrificed. But the the old king, the old ruler, the old son would give way to the new son. The uh, and this temple is really interesting because what happened next was Islam basically took it over, built one of the most beautiful mosques in the world over it, and and so this temple to Hadad and temple to Saint John the Baptist exist in the mosque today, and, and despite everything that has gone on. Um, over the last 1500 years, uh, Christianity and, and Islam being at odds, the, the temple is the only one that's still allowed uh, to be visited by Christians, by Westerners, and even by women. And stranger that that is that women still go to this temple to uh, go into the temple of Hadad or St. John, and they believe by going there they will become fertile. So it's what, what they don't really uh, specifically convey to us, we can understand that there's an unbroken tradition there that the sun god still has such power and, and that people in their humanness uh, still understand that power even if uh, thousands of years of religion tried to get us away from those beliefs. And those beliefs that center around a 
n- n- principles of nature, as it were, the laws of nature being expressed in the form of gods so that the ordinary person will respect them. Uh, this is this goes back almost to the beginning of time, uh, this process, and our religions have arisen out of it, which is why in Christianity we have this echo of past religions uh, that uh, that um, that uh, uh, that su- suggest n- those natural laws. Now, w- would you say that that Christianity is a more real or less real religion, or is that even a fair question for you, Stephen? I think it, it's a less real religion because we've taken so much out of it, and um, I think in part Constantine was to blame. He wanted to make the religion definitely an earthly religion that didn't compete with the religion of state, which was uh, the rule in Rome. And so things like if Jesus had brothers and sisters, um, Mary being a virgin, things like that were all introduced to the religion so Jesus wouldn't have an earthly heir either through, um, say, his own son or daughter, through a marriage with Mary Magdalene or whoever, or even through a cousin or a brother's child that uh, would carry on that combination of the priestly and kingly line. So that was the agreement that was made then. And and since then, one by one, everything kind of fell out of the religion. And I think um, it's because someone was allowed to rule on top and make decisions that uh, kind of affected the rest of us. But along the way, at the same time, the people still had their own beliefs. And so in a lot of cases, the I think it was St. Jerome that advised, uh, he used the expression actually, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So if, if you were a missionary to Ireland and people were um, worshipping, say, the Rock of Cashel, well, you couldn't ruin their rock or you couldn't move them from to celebrate elsewhere so the best thing was to build a church on the rock and and to basically celebrate the same kind of thing in a new form so christianity has kind of taken a lot of the magic out of things and uh, even though people have brought a lot of that magic back to religion this is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. In just a few minutes, we're going to go to the Americas to a mysterious place on Rhode Island. We're going to do this way back in the past with Verrazano in a small ship, traveling almost alone far away in search of perhaps a lost colony. We'll be right back. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online and on the IBC Radio Network. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back with Stephen Sora. High adventure today. The lost colony of the Templars deep in the Americas long, long before Columbus. Something strange and unexpected was going on. But before we go there, we have to take a leap from the Orkneys to Stonehenge to Aachen Cathedral. Stephen, what is the similarity? And bearing in mind that Aachen Cathedral is is 3,000 years after uh, Stonehenge and 6,000 years after the Orkneys, what does Aachen Cathedral have in common with them? It is considered one of the sacred places in the world, and we've lost kind of... Um, what happened from ancient times to what happened till Charlemagne. Basically, uh, Aachen in the time of Charlemagne became such a religious center of the Christian religion, and uh, it became a place where sacred objects were collected from all over the world and brought there. The, the cathedral itself uh, contains things that, uh, like Chartres, they did not want to um, really be as public about as far as like uh, labyrinths and uh, and places where the sun will rise in one place, uh, kind of, the wind is kind of uh, put in place to measure the the sun rising and the moon rising, and uh, and the conjunction of the two. Now, uh, John Young, the author of Sacred Sites of the Knight Templar, as you point out in your book, uh, says the two concentric circles of columns in Aachen Cathedral correspond exactly with the two circles of Stonehenge. He determined that several astronomical calculations had to have been used to allow sunlight through certain windows at the spring and fall equinoxes, meaning that somebody 
under the surface, who we don't have any historical record of, had carried that knowledge forward 3,000 years. Awesome, awesome transmission. And in, and in not only had they put it in Aachen Cathedral, but these octagonal temples are all over Europe, and not just in Europe. There's even one here in the Americas. Why don't you tell us a little bit about exactly what we're talking about here in the Americas? The uh, What I believe happened was that the Templars, when they came back from Jerusalem, started building these monuments all over. And... Uh, there's a book about the secret island of the Templars, which is Bornholm in, off Denmark, and uh, one was built in the Orkneys, which is complete ruins today. The Cistercian Order built them as well, uh, places like Tomar, which was the seat of the uh, Knights of Christ in Portugal, and they all basically look pretty much the same. They have odd-shaped windows, um, in some cases very tiny windows, and... Uh, and two different floors. They they have uh, reasons for why they were built uh, come out different in different places. In, in Ireland, the one that the Cistercians built at Mellifont is called a lava bow, and it was said that the monks would go up to the first floor off a of ground level and go up, have an opportunity to wash, and then they would uh, have their lunch there. In other places, they were called baptism, baptisteries, where baptisms actually took place. And again, the octagonal shape is to... Um, represent infinity that through baptism we are, we are born again in an eternal life the most amazing thing is that there's a tower in Newport that's built the exact same way and in some cases measuring up um, within inches of one that's built in Cambridge and the one that's built on Bornholm and ex the same type of shape now when, when the colonists came over Benedict Arnold, not the trader, but his grandfather, uh, settled there, and he called it my stone-built windmill. So a lot of people thought that he might have built it himself, but it, it obviously was not used as any place that um, grain would be kept or anything like that, uh, because there's recessed walls that uh, would have included fireplaces on the second story. These, uh, So he just incorporated it into his own farm, and he probably... Um, did a certain amount of uh, cleaning up as far as putting new mortar in it and things like that. It hasn't been until the last two or three years that um, a photographer, Jim Egan, started taking pictures of this tower on astronomically significant days. And uh, the eclipses, um, I'm sorry, not eclipses, the solstice, the equinox, and also the declination of the moon. And he's produced some amazing photographs that... Um, that show when these things happen, and they'll happen with the, the light coming in the slit of one window coming out the slit of another window. So the fact that uh, this was built to the same kind of specifications, and him and two other people then uh, started surveying the sites in Europe, for the first time we're finding out that, that these were all built according to the same science. So for someone in the United States in the colonial times to have built it as a windmill or as a grain mill or something like that is, is just preposterous. It was built before then. And we really have proof that it was built before then from Verrazzano himself, don't we? Well, uh, from Verrazzano, um, what we have is the map that he made and the letters that he brought back uh, when he came back from his coasting voyage of North America. And he called it a Norman villa, which... Um, he had sailed from Normandy in France, so may have had something to do with it. But he also wrote on the map Refugio, the refuge. And uh, and so one has the question what was what it actually meant over there. One actually has the question the whole voyage. Verrazano went to the French king. He brought him a book called um, the book about Arcadia that was the rage in Europe all the time and that features prominently in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And after bringing him that book, he convinced him he needed to go to this new world. He sailed straight across the ocean uh, to Madeira, and then he sailed straight across to basically North Carolina area. He sails up the coast, claiming that he's looking for China or India. He actually saw across um, the, the sandbars, basically, that make up the Outer Banks. He says that uh, across these sandbars... 
there's the other ocean which would take you to China. If that was so, there's certainly many breaks in them. He could have uh, either portaged the boat or taken it around and sailed that way, but he seemed to have no interest. He sailed up to New York where he stayed for a couple of days in New York Harbor, but basically at anchor in the harbor because uh, the natives were hostile there. He then um, sailed along uh, Long Island to Rhode Island. In his log, he says that an Indian piloted his boat into this harbor that is Newport. And to actually get to where the tower is, you have, it's not something that you see from Long Island Sound or um, whatever they call it there, the Block Island Sound. You have to make a trip into one passage, then another one, and then a third one. It's a very protected harbor in Newport. And there stands the tower. So I believe that Verrazano all along had been looking for that tower, and, and certain things about his own background uh, show that he was part of this um, kind of transmission of knowledge that existed in Europe and was kept secret from the church. So he finds um, having a, a guide there and meeting a chief that whose name was Magnus, which sounds more like a Scottish name than, uh, than a Rhode Island Pequot Indian or anything. And so he spends two weeks there, he gets back on the ship, sails the coast of Maine, pick up the current, and headed straight back home. So it was a very quick voyage. The only place he stopped more than two days, it was two weeks in, in Newport. I believe he was looking for the Templar colony that uh, Henry Sinclair actually said that he was going to found in the New World. And disappointingly enough, they knew it as the place of refuge, and they found the Templar monument that only could have been built by uh, someone that was initiated into Templar science. And uh, but there was no one there, and uh, and he went back to France to uh, report it to whoever you know had sponsored him, and uh, to whoever he kind of uh, got to sponsor his voyage in the first place. This was, of course, uh, very early in the Renaissance, but the result that that well, for example, Sinclair had attempted to colonize the Americas and create the mythical land of Arcadia. And we'll get into what exactly Arcadia was uh, just after the break. At, at, when it, when there, there was the church was an immensely press, oppressive presence in Europe, that even daring to make any kind of statement with any kind of scientific rationality would lead you to the stake. Uh, Galileo for saying that the Earth revolved around the sun was nearly burned to death. And, you know, in a, this show is, is relevant in the sense that we're kind of going to trying to kind of go back to that in America now. And people are saying, well, this is actually a, uh, the Christian, uh, reconstructionists. I'm not certainly speaking of most Christians, but the extreme edge are saying that this, that the country should reconstitute itself, uh, under biblical law, so to speak, and that we could, uh, we could end up in a situation if, Things go wrong for us over the next ten or fifteen years, where uh, we have a kind of new Taliban. So this is a very big issue here. It gets to the to the enormous question of what is the United States of America? Why is it so important? And what kind of freedom was this country founded to protect and foster? This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland online and on the IBC Radio Network. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. I'm having a great conversation with Stephen Sora. His book, The Lost Colony of the Templars, Verrazano's Secret Mission to the Americas. Stephen Sora knows something. His website, www.templartreasure.com. Templartreasure.com. William Mann says, Stephen Sora has once again confirmed his position as one of only a handful of having the ability to see the signs along the past of the Knight Templar in America. Of course, you must you must know Bill Mann. He's been a guest on this program. Uh, the, the his book, The Knights Templar in the New World, is one of those books that probably uh, inspired you to stretch as brilliantly as you have in this book. Would that be probably would be true, wouldn't it? Uh, Bill Mann's opened up many uh, doors, and some of them I haven't been able to really get through. But um, definitely. Um 
Well, to, Bill, Bill yeah, Mann so. kind of bleeds off into very secret areas. I think he might be a Templar, frankly. I mean, I think his family might have have preserved Templar knowledge. And I've often wondered, when I was talking to him on Dreamland about a year ago, I thought that, you know, I wrote this book called The Key, uh, which is a conversation that I had in, in Toronto with a gentleman who, who I've never quite been able to identify, but over the years it's become very obvious to me that this was a person in possession, uh, intact possession of deep Templar knowledge and of uh, knowledge from before the Templars, of the, some of the deepest knowledge that exists in this world. And when I was talking to William Mann on the radio, I came close to believing he might know who that was. Uh, he wouldn't really... He wouldn't really say it, but I just have a feeling that among the Masons and the Templars of Canada, this great knowledge remains intact. And what, how do you react to that? I agree with you. I, I think that there's things in Canada that, uh, especially Nova Scotia, that so many people take their Masonry so serious, and it seems that um, I've met Nova Scotian Masons that, basically take a pilgrimage to Roslyn in Scotland and and then um, the same Masons from Scotland take a pilgrimage to Nova Scotia so that there must be a, a larger reality there and yes. as far as people that I met in Masonry um, I think I've met more Canadians that are uh, so deep into the research in comparison to people that I've met in, in this country. Masonry has it, it failed in this country in, 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 in large part. There are some important lodges left, but I think that it became social and commercial. Uh, something went wrong with Masonry in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, from which it ultimately did not recover, but that's not true in the UK and in uh, in especially in Canada and also in Italy, the masonry is still very much alive. But it's interesting that you mentioned Nova Scotia, and when we're talking uh, for subscribers, we'll be talking about modern day Templars, and we'll be talking about that that pilgrimage from uh, back and forth between Nova Scotia and Scotland, and what that may all mean. But let's go on now. Uh, with we are we are now it's 1524, and Verrazano has come to the Americas. And he has been he has been looking for something called Arcadia. Now, of course, in uh, Poussin's extraordinary painting, uh, that uh, the name of which is going to escape me because I'm trying to talk about it. In any case, it has a tomb on it, and on the tomb is inscribed a line from that from from uh, from a poem. The line is, "And in Arcadia I am, et in Arcadia ego." And if you've ever wondered what that mysterious line meant, well, you're going to find out, because Stephen knows. Uh, tell us a little bit about Arcadia and its significance. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm referring to Sanazaro's book, published in 1502. Um, Sanazaro's book is really interesting, because when I read it, I was completely shocked. I thought it was going to be uh, kind of another book like Virgil's book, and just describing um, the idyllic world. And uh, it's the Eden that we've lost, and, and that's been kind of a theme. Um, Sanazaro's book is um, so many more things. They're mystical, um, alchemy. He just throws everything in the, in the soup, and I, and I think that um, there's probably a, a guide needed to actually read the book and get what one should out of it. But the uh, the world, as you mentioned, was really torn apart by Christianity, and it kind of put the um, covered the lamp of learning for for everywhere that Christianity reached. And it was a time where, at, at the same time, people were discovering new sciences. Whether it was because they brought them back from the Crusades, or there was just uh, a recovery of uh, texts from Greeks. Um, that was happening at the same time. People were starting to look at the world in a completely different way, and the church cracked down on that. They didn't want anybody to do that. And so people like um, Sanazaro wrote of the idyllic world. Francis Bacon carried it a step further, said that uh, the Arcadia was where people would be able to, uh, he called it Ben Salem, but basically the meaning was the same, a place where people were free to learn, uh, to... Um, openly discuss science 
without the fear of being uh, persecuted by religion uh, for their thoughts. And I think a lot of people uh, specifically uh, that were connected to Masonry felt the same way, that uh, we've gone very wrong as a culture. Masonry kind of opened that thinking up. They, uh, it was not forbidden to uh, go down any different path. Uh, there was no dogma in, in Masonry. The guiding lamp was that there is a God, but uh, it didn't have to be any specific God, and, and it didn't have to come along with all the dogma that um, makes Christianity unpalatable in, in many cases. And so Henry Sinclair was part of this group. The uh, His family ended up becoming the hereditary guardians of Freemasonry long after um, the Templars were disbanded. And in 1398, he sailed to the New World. Uh, He sailed to Nova Scotia. There's uh, a monument in Chidacto Bay that uh, people truly believe there, even though they may not really subscribe to it in the United States, that Henry Sinclair sailed over there. And he split his fleet, and uh, the fleet that went home was under the impression that he was looking for a place to uh, found a colony in the New World. And why? Uh, Because this was the Arcadia, and when he talked to the natives there, uh, they called their place Acadia, which um, may have really made a light bulb go on for him that, okay, he had found the world that he was looking for. He, there's evidence or maybe that he, he had found, down just, the just, coast in, just to, in just Massachusetts. Hold, hold on a second, Stephen. Before we go on, maybe he knew that he would find an even older tradition, maybe the same body of knowledge that took Stonehenge all the way to Aachen Cathedral over a 3,000-year period, also contained in it uh, knowledge of perhaps where somebody may be who had the deep, deep secrets still intact, and maybe they found them in the Americas. We always assume that the Templars found the the the, the great treasure of knowledge under the temple in Jerusalem, but perhaps it was when they came to Canada that the that the true the the true River, the underground river, as it were, that figures so prominently in myth, uh, in the myth surrounding this, was was finally tapped. Is there anything in that idea? Uh, I believe there is, and and you just uh, really made me think here. There's one place that uh, his expedition was known to have gone, and it, it's very close to a place in New Hampshire that we call Stonehenge of the Americas. Right. Stonehenge of the Americas is a site that's uh, well, it's not set up just like Stonehenge. It um, basically has the same functions, different stones in different places. A heel stone where the sun would rise on on uh, the equinox day. And the whole area, acres and acres um, of these stones in, in different almost temples where they had what they call sacrificial stones, um, different structures that they, they still haven't understood. He went past this area, and in Westford, Massachusetts, just across the border, we find a granite ledge with an effigy of a knight. Uh, that knight, through the heraldry on his um, his clothing, showed that he was Sir James Gunn, uh, someone that was a lieutenant of the Sinclairs that um, had brought the Orkneys into the Sinclairs realm, and uh, who was only, Sinclair was only able to govern the Orkneys with the consent of the Gunn clan. And so such a, um, a monument there, which people still do scoff at, but it's indisputable if one sees um, what this actually looks like. Further south, there was, uh, in Fall River, there was a suit of armor that was found, and then further south from that was Newport. And, and I believe it's the Templars um, that under the Sinclair family, that trip down uh, from Nova Scotia all the way down to Newport, Rhode Island, and the the coastal climate and everything in, in Rhode Island would have been the optimal place to colony. Now, uh, the optimal place to found a colony, and of course, the 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 uh, so-called Norman villa, the the temple in uh, Rhode Island, is big. It's not. This is not a small structure. 
this is a substantial amount of effort and work went into it. Well, we're approaching the end of our time together on Dreamland with Stephen Sora, but not entirely because on the subscriber section, we're going even deeper. We're pretty deep now, but there's a lot more information that we are about to find out from Stephen Sora. This is Whitley Streeper. Next up on Dreamland, Linda Moulton Howe. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online and on the IBC Radio Network. You're about to experience something that you just can't get elsewhere. Emmy Award winning science reporter Linda Moulton Howe reporting on the absolute leading edge of science, discovery, and the true mysteries of the unknown. Don't miss her website, earthfiles.com, the one science website that tells you the secrets, the facts that others dare not. Earthfiles.com. This week, she's reporting on an extraordinarily early start to the crop circle season and an animal mutilation in Arkansas. So bizarre, it is going to shock you senseless. Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. It was seven years ago, on June 7th, 1999, a few minutes after midnight in Hooven, Holland, the 19-year-old Robert Vandenbroeke woke up and felt compelled to look out his second-story bedroom window. Robert opened the curtains and said that he saw, quote, a small, misty, pinkish-purple light, unquote, shaped like a football coming over the wheat field at a height of about 10 feet. The light stopped about 150 feet from his house. And then the light started to elongate, spreading out, becoming thinner and thinner, looking like a disc. And when it was about 30 feet in diameter, Robert saw what he called electrical discharges emitted from the bottom of the pinkish-purple light. After that, the light faded away. Robert ran outside into the wheat, and there was a 30-foot diameter circle, fresh, laid down next to a 10-foot diameter circle. It's been studied by a physicist in Holland, and every year since then, more circles and other patterns have appeared near the Vandenbroeke house. And now, in the early morning of April 6, 2005, Robert found two more, only about 600 feet from where circles have appeared in previous years. These new ones, uh, the biggest is 30 feet in diameter, and the smaller is 5.5 feet in diameter. Robert called up a local television station which announced the discovery to the Dutch public. One of the listeners was Robert Borman, founder of the Ta Foundation and producer of the Dutch Crop Circle Archive. Robert Borman called a friend, Peter, who went to Hooven a little after twilight on April 6th and took photographs before people had walked through the circles. You can see his and Robert Borman's photographs at my website, www.earthfiles.com. On the headlines page, there is a hot link to the 2005 Hooven Holland Crop Circle Report. Peter's camera had problems. He did get good photos, but he wondered if there was an unusual energy in the circles which interfered with his camera's operation. Camera malfunctions have happened so often in crop circles around the world And four days later, on April 10th, Robert Borman visited the circles and said that he could photograph without any problems. And here is how he described the circles. When we visited the formation Sunday, um, we saw that the the, the large circle was approximately uh, 8 8 meters 90 till 10 meters 10, and the small circle was about 1 meter 70. The lay of the grass in the uh, large circle was... um, clockwise, and the small circle was anti-clockwise, and the strange thing, uh, Rob Trouw measured that uh, uh, the grass of the uh, big circle was laying clockwise, as I told, but the energy was floating uh, anti-clockwise. Do you mean from not using some kind of uh, energy measuring uh, sticks like they do with ley lines? Yeah, he it, 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 it uses uh, dowsing rods and other equipment. Like okay. That. And he measured that the, the, uh, the lay was to the right, but the energy was floating to the left. And the same in the small circle was the lay was to the left, and the energy was floating to the right. Two people who
who stood in the center of that larger circle, also reported feeling heat. A woman felt her face get warmer, and a young man said that his feet got warmer. Temperature changes have also been reported in the center of other European crop formations, but no one knows what is happening. Why is there a temperature change? And among the many unanswered Earth mysteries is one that is very disturbing. The unusual bloodless animal deaths around the world that law enforcement has long called mutilations. According to American military and intelligence sources, the phenomenon goes back to at least 1951, when U.S. government investigators described the perpetrators in alleged top-secret documents as, quote, extraterrestrial biological entities, unquote. Over the past five decades, ranchers have found their cattle, horses, goats, sheep, pigs, rabbits, and even cats and dogs dead with excisions of tissue that defy easy explanation. One of those ranchers is 43 years old Ricky Lummis from Doddridge, Arkansas. He has been raising animals for half his life. Nine years ago, he and his family moved on to 90 acres in southwestern Arkansas between Bloomberg, Texas, and Doddridge, Arkansas, very near the borders where Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana come together. He runs his cattle with cow dogs, and recently he had added two male puppies, about two months old, to his other five dogs for a total of seven. Further north in Ashdown and Hope, Arkansas, there have been several unusual cattle deaths over the past several de decades, which I have documented in my books with hematologists, pathologists, and other investigators. And those books, An Alien Harvest and Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses, along with my TV documentaries, A Strange Harvest and Strange Harvest 1993, can be uh, examined in terms of information about them at earthfiles.com in the Earth Files shop. Right now, at the top of my Earth Files headlines page is the interview and many, many photos that I am now going to discuss in this Dreamland report. The Ricky Lummis family had never seen animal mutilations on their property or anywhere else in the surrounding community until Sunday morning, April 10th, 2005, around 10.20 a.m., Ricky Lummis was leaving for church after his wife, a Sunday school teacher, had gone earlier with their daughters. I was on my way out to go to church and saw uh, buzzards, low-flying buzzards. You know, they was low, you know, kind of flying low, and I knew that they was looking at something. And since I have cattle, you know, I always check. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I found, that's when I found the dog. I, I drove, you know. I just made a, I made a U-turn and come back and found, found my dog. And, and when I drove up, you know, I could, I could see immediately that, you know, it had, it had been. I mean, it was real obvious that he had been cut with a, you know, very sharp instrument. And yet, there does not appear to be blood anywhere around the animal on the ground on the cuts. None whatsoever. None. The ground was just wasn't even disturbed. Just to, you know, really, I mean, there was no, you know, I've seen a lot of animals, a lot of dead, you know, and it's always, you know, but I've never, <laughs> it has just baffled me. Uh, no blood whatsoever. I noticed the first thing I noticed was part of his spine. His, his spine, his backbone. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I noticed. Part of you know, it looks about a two inch, maybe a two two and a half inch section of his span. You can you know, it's cut or it's some way or another removed. You know, just a just a piece, just like you cut a board, just like you cut a piece of board out and removed it. That's the way. That's the first thing I noticed on his span, on his backbone. Was it that it was missing? It was gone. Uh, was was the cut very smooth? Uh, yes, the cut on the spine was, uh, there was no splinters. I'll say this, there was no splinters, no, uh, it was even. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't broke just like he splintered it off on one side and the other. It was, it was real, you know, it was even on both sides, not 
any tears or splinters at all in the bone. And as I look at these pictures, it looks almost as if this animal was laid down in that pasture in this condition. Well, that was the odd thing. When I drive out through there or walk out through there, the grass mats down. You know, it lays down. You can see it leaves tracks. You know, I mean, you can't walk out there without, you know, leaving some sign of, you know, if you rode a bicycle out there, I could follow your trail. But where the dog was, I could not, I couldn't figure it out because the first thing I looked for was signs of, you know, of tracks or maybe four-wheeler tracks or vehicle or foot or something and and nothing, just nothing. I, I couldn't, we couldn't, I called my brother, he came down, we searched and searched for some kind of clue where they came in or whoever or whatever, and we couldn't find no sign of nobody coming on my property. I have a dirt road coming in, you know, you leave tracks on a dirt road, and there was no tracks out of the ordinary, so and that's, that's strange. Y yes, it is, and if I understand, this was a two-month-old cow puppy, mm -hmm. or cow dog, to be yeah. a cow dog. I work my cattle with dogs. In other words, we, you know, I, you know, I work in dogs. You know, cattle, I, I pen them, you know, and they, I just work cattle with dogs, and, and I've got real good cow dogs. And this puppy was the one I was going to keep out of this set of cow dogs I have. And uh, he was he was a good one. There was going to be a good one. He really wasn't old enough to be good yet, but I could tell he was a smart little dog. And could you please start with his head? Well, he had two holes in his head, just real clean holes in his head, one right above his, I think, right above his eye, and then the other one was kind of, you'd nearly say between his eyes, but it was up above, up on his head quite a ways. Was there any kind of liquid of any kind coming from those holes, or were they dry? They were uh, basically dry. Now, when was the last that you and your family saw and played with him? About 8.30 or 9 o'clock Saturday night. And everything was fine? Yes. My daughters were playing with him out in the yard till dark. Uh, and, you know, like they do every day. And uh, it's just a pretty sad situation. Now, then, on Saturday night... Uh, April 9th, you would have had seven dogs near your home, correct? Yes. Did you hear any barking? Yes. Uh, approximately 1 o'clock, I heard, I have two dogs here that really is good watch dogs. They, they, uh, they was barking about 1 o'clock, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't, investigate as much as I should have, uh, but they they did bark. The Texarkana Gazette said, quote, Loomis said he would normally shine a spot spotlight on the area, but wasn't able to do so because the batteries for the spotlight were dead. Exactly. exactly. I've got a big spotlight, and it lights up the world, and, and I did. I did go to investigate when the dogs was barking, and the battery was down on the flash, on the spotlight. This was a big spotlight. Mm -hmm. The batteries was down, and I didn't have no way to to really see what it, what they was barking at. So I just I, I kind of brushed it off, mm -hmm. and that's that's the only really the only time I always investigate when my dogs are barking or when something's going on for some reason. That night, my batteries, my spotlight wouldn't work. I, I didn't see no no lights or you know. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't hear anything. Did you look up in the sky? No. Have you heard about this happening in your area before? No, not close to here. Now I've heard of it up around Hope in Little River County in Arkansas. Uh, you know, a couple, three years back maybe. Uh, and the sheriff's deputies, you know, they they said it's happened before, but I hadn't. I've never saw it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I've heard I've heard a little bit about this kind of type of stuff, but you know I'm kind of like uh, you know it's bad to say I was kind of like everybody else you know just kind of brush it off and kind of skeptical about it, but I'm not anymore. Because <laughs> when it happens to you, and you see what people or what happens, it changes your mind. Because it's so weird. Yes. Yes, it's it's it is. It's it's real weird. Uh, I mean, if you know, if the dog would have been out in the pasture and just been shot, or you know, if there had been tracks, or you know, if there had been blood everywhere, if it looked like he was, you know, animals, it's hard to kill a dog or an animal, you know, and they're gonna try to drag yourself around. You can tell the, you know, grounds usually disturbed around where animals died because they don't die easy. And you know, not a not a blade of grass uh, out of the ordinary, and that that's what that's just where I can that, that that's what gets me. In addition to the unexplained surgical removal of the six-inch section of the puppy's spine, a few ribs were also cleanly cut off, as we have seen in other cases around the country in previous years and the tongue was gone, surrounded by a mass of what the veterinarian thought was insect larva. But the puzzle is, why would a huge mass of larva end up inside the puppy's mouth with the cut tongue only hours after death and nowhere else on the body? You can see good photographs of all of this at my website, www.earthbiles.com. At the headlines page, click on the report about this highly strange dog death in Arkansas. And since I posted this report at Earth Files this week, Ricky Lummis has now learned from neighboring ranchers within a couple of miles of his ranch that within the last four weeks, a 2,000-pound bull was found on top of a log pile. The bull's owner told Mr. Lummis that it was, quote, as if something had dropped the bull from the sky, unquote. And yet, that rancher had not reported the strange discovery to anyone until now. Another ranch neighbor told Mr. Lummis that also in the past four weeks, one of his young calves was found completely stripped of its hide. But he did not report that animal either. Stripped hide has been reported many times in areas where the more classic animal mutilations are simultaneously occurring. Mr. Lummis and I would like to appeal to the Earth Files and Dreamland audiences that if anyone has any information about what's happening to animals in southwestern Arkansas right now or surrounding states or anywhere else in the United States or other countries, please contact me at my email address, which is earthfiles at earthfiles.com. We may learn about new cases and everything that we learn helps put this strange puzzle a little clearer. And so, Whitley, it's been nearly 60 years, according to Colonel Corso, that our government privately and secretly started investigating these cases, and they're still going on, as far as I can tell, right now. Well, Linda, at least the authorities have graduated from coyotes to devil worshippers. That's progress. (laughs) Uh, I'm telling you, I would not sleep a night not a night out there. Those poor people living out there, I'm going to remember them boy, in my prayers. Thank you very well, much. I, may I just say quickly, yeah, sure. I have never known a farm family anywhere that I've been uh, to have been affected, and I have walked in so many pastures by myself, uh, gathering physical evidence and grass, soils, and tissue, and I'm still here. I think whatever the phenomena is, it, in this case, it's focused on the animals. Well, let's hope so. Linda Moulton Howe, thank you for a terrific and chilling report. Next week on Dreamland, a buried story that the Pentagon has lost track of $2.3 trillion. <laughs> and, and that's just typical. I, know. I mean, is that incredible? What's the, what's the excuse? Uh, gee, I had it when I came in. Uh, you know, of course, you and I both know, Whitley, <laughs> that that money is not missing and it's not it didn't just disappear that is what is funding 
the covert government of the United States, the shadow government, the secret team, as Colonel Prouty called it, the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, parallel government that, that David uh, that Bill Moyers talked about, the the people who are really trying, who have covert agendas, and they are getting the U.S. Ta- taxpayer to fund their efforts at globalization, or to put it more succinctly, world control. Right, and folks, we're going to have to close down here with uh, Jim. We're just talking, just very briefly, we're going to be talking to Stephen Sora in just a moment. And, you know, it'll remind you when we get to Stephen Sora what this country's really all about and what we need to take back, because we've lost it. We lost it, and when President Truman said uh, after his... After his uh, term in office, what was the asked? What was the biggest mistake he made? He said very simply, forming the Central Intelligence Agency. He was absolutely right. When Dwight Eisenhower uh, left office, he warned that the military-industrial complex was a grave danger to the freedom of the United States of America. It has happened, folks. This thing is strangling us. It is taking the life right out of us. It is threatening your children right now. You got to get. We got to get. Things changed here. We've got to take action on our own behalf. And believe me, nobody in Washington right now... Okay. And, of course, this is why all of a sudden now we're seeing a series of very strange and debilitating diseases, uh, like um, various strains of influenza, the Ebola, the Hanta viruses, the uh, mad cow, the, you know, you name it. All of these strange diseases are now suddenly popping up and that are certainly affecting, if not debilitating, uh, mankind's natural immunization system. So I think that whether this turns out to be a terrorist attack or whether it turns out to be simply some sort of incredible bureaucratic mistake, I think it should alert all of us that we better be paying more attention and closer scrutiny to uh, these matters because... If you don't have your health, you really haven't got anything, do you, Whitley? Well, you really don't, Jim. And what is so disturbing about this is obviously uh, it's being considered very seriously at top levels, but there's been no planning, uh, no forethought at all put into it. Uh, you told me before we got on the air what the White House press secretary said about this, which did two things. One, it was a laughably silly statement on the one hand and on the other hand it does mean that there's concern that's true and of course that's uh, you know it's a typical polit- politician's uh, remark to show concern and yet also give evidence that they really don't know what they're talking about yeah, well, what did Scott he say McClellan, oh, yeah, okay. Scott McClellan the White House Secretary uh, said that they are busy assessing the risk and they don't want to take any chances and that the Centers for Disease Control is working on it and yada yada and then he ends up by saying what we're asking is that if anyone this week when it was revealed that testing kits containing a flu virus which no one born after 1968 is immune to had been sent around to more than 3,700 laboratories in 18 different countries from Brazil to Lebanon out of a lab here in the United States, the College of American Pathologists. And they have been sending this around between October of last year and February. This is either a fantastic oversight or an act of very subtle and carefully considered bioterrorism. We don't know which it is or exactly who's motivated here to do what, but we've got somebody who probably has some pretty darn good guesses with us right now today, Jim Mars, the author of Alien Agenda, Rule by Secrecy, and so many other of the great books that we rely on to keep our noses in front of the truth. Welcome, Jim. Hey, Whitley. Yeah, this is definitely a very strange thing because um, if this was some sort of intentional terrorist attack, it, it was not done very constructively. Uh, even though it was sent out all across the world, it was, after all, sent to testing laboratories, which should have the capability of handling something like this. Uh, it may turn out to be simply a huge bureaucratic uh, mistake. However, it is also being compared to the anthrax attacks 
that took place immediately following the uh, terrorist attacks of 9-11. And I might point out, as most people probably have failed to really seriously stop and know, is that that anthrax that killed five Americans was weapons-grade military-type anthrax that was only made or found in the United States military. So uh, I think there's some very strange things going on in the health issue of terrorism, and I would also uh, like to point out the and remind everybody of the strange and mysterious series of deaths uh, of microbiologists that have taken place around the world over the past uh, several years. Uh, this is very disquieting because these are the very people who could tell us more about these deadly strains of disease and probably come up with some sort of a vaccine or some sort of a cure or remedy. And furthermore, if you've read my book, Rule by Secrecy, you'll know that there is a movement by the globalist. That's what they call themselves. Some people refer to them as the New World Order. But these are the people within the secret societies who are trying to come up with their own agendas and their own plans for reducing world problems. Uh, General Maxwell Taylor, a insider with the Council on Foreign Relations back in the early 70s, was quoted as saying that, uh, and I think he was reflecting their viewpoint when he said that by the next century, meaning now, they really needed to get rid of about a third of the world's population and that they would do this through limited uh, regional conflicts like the fighting that's now going on in Iraq and in Afghanistan and Colombia and other places. Disease, like the starvation that is continually rampant in Africa, sub saharan Africa, and diseases. Okay, sees any suspicious illness that it be reported immediately. Well, you know, God, what are you talking about? Well, what are they, yeah, what is my suspicious neighbor, illness? You know, is coughing. Do I report him? Uh, what? What? Well, now you know. Speaking of suspicious illnesses and the loss of so many <laughs> scientists who might be quite crucial in all of this in the near future, uh, we have um, uh, Ann and I have been not living in Texas for quite a while, and we, we may be back there soon, just for a visit anyway. Uh, we no longer, uh, we've, our house, we don't, we had a house in San Antonio, we no longer have any more. But anyway, uh, our doctor immediately upon hearing this said, no, no, you can't go back there. Annie's been in the hospital, she's got to get a booster for pertussis, which is whooping cough, because there is an epidemic of whooping cough in Texas. And I was flabbergasted. Then I found out that my brother's wife, probably my brother, my nephew, his son, had all had the disease recently. And mm. you don't read anything about this in any newspapers, but it's no, there. No. Well, of course, that gets back to my main soapbox, which is uh, there is no real news media in this country any longer. There's only uh, corporate advertising distribution systems uh, that are generally controlled by about three major corporations, and they and only this, take and this things distraction that they want system, to hear. Jim, this thing that distracts us always from what is important, like right now we're finished with Terry Schiavo. Before Terry Schiavo, what was it? Uh some movie star probably now we're going to go back to michael jackson then uh what we're never going to do is look down there's no one going and looking under the under the uh under the rocks i found out there's in our newsletter this week a fantastic b- 